Hello everyone. Yes, it's really that time of the year again. Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is just days away and I'm here backstage at the High Holy Days. So come with us for a look behind the scenes on this Rabbiting On special. Rabbiting On Hello and welcome to Rabbiting On. It is, uh, as always, a huge pleasure uh, to be joined by my wonderful colleagues, Rabbi Miriam Berger and Rabbi Robin ashworth -Steed. I'm Rabbi Debbie Young-Summers. And how are Miriam and Robin this week? <laughs> I'm a little bit like, uh, you know, rabbit in the headlights. It just... <laughs> how is it so soon? Yeah, it's so stressful, isn't it? Just so soon and summer holidays straight into... And not only into the usual chaos of High Holy Days, but into navigating multi-access services of like we're doing on Zoom and in person. Um, and it's incredibly hard to lead a service and it, how I've got the setup anyway, it, it's it's a completely new world um, as Rosh Hashanah is meant to be because we're returning to a new year, you know, all that stuff. But it, it feels particularly intense, doesn't it? We've got the uh, added bonus of kind of that piece of what, how do you cope with your 10 year old who's being very grown up about the fact that his um, first two days back um, are Rosh Hashanah and therefore, mm. um, you know, won't be able to, to be with his uh, class and with his new teacher and everything else till day three. Um, and just one of those like, what does it mean to be a British Jew? And mm. some of those hurdles that you have to learn to overcome at a young age. Uh, and that thing that I really think I'd got a little bit complacent about the High Holy Days because you know, at the beginning, when you first go into your community, I, I remember kind of sitting and reading through the liturgy again and again to make sure it was all fluent and, you know, every post-it note and covenant and everything else written out in full. And, you know, I would say by a couple of years ago, I was, I was coasting through the High Holy Days. And um, then, you know, last year, obviously, the machsor was ripped up and we were given a blank piece of paper and we were told, okay, make the High Holy Days in lockdown. Uh, and then we're doing, you know, year two major creativity of what does it mean to find an appropriate venue where people feel safe um, and uh, how to do the High Holy Days in a way that, that works in this year's reality. Um, and and uh, this is the earliest that Rosh Hashanah can be bar one day um, mm. in the calendar. So we've got all that added pressure. Um, and you know, we've Well, been... then I'm going to be grateful for Monday. Monday's day of preparation is just going to be an added bonus because it could have been worse. That's what we're saying. <laughs> it could have been Sunday. But, you know, we, we would normally start really planning the High Holy Days, possibly, you know, a bit after Shavuot. But this is, you know, our lay leaders and our professional team have been meeting and planning since Pesach. Mm. Um, and that was true last year as well. I think for two years on the road, you know, it's there's so much that's still unknown about what we're facing in the coming weeks. And we're doing everything we can to plan. But ultimately, we don't really know what's going to happen, who's going to show up, um, you know, have people booked and they won't come. Will people all try and book in the last minute? Um there's so much that's unknown and if anyone god forbid has a positive test in the next few days you know that's disaster mm. it's kind of fascinating isn't it that um i'm obsessed as i'm sure loads of people are with, with the book that alan lou um Zichon wrote this is real and you're completely unprepared it's about the high holy days and it completely transformed the way i saw the high holy days and he really explains you know see understanding it that you're really coming face to face with mortality you know you dress on Yom Kippur as if you're in your you know um as if you're shroud. dead yeah in your shroud you're not eating or drinking and completely transformed the way I saw it this year however I feel like I really get it like I really the sense of like vulnerability of like all the apprehension people are feeling about their own health concerns and going into the building. And we can, I feel the apprehension and anxiety in the community of what it means to be in high holy days that last year was different. We didn't have that coming into the building because we were all in our homes, you know, sheltered in a, in a way. Um, 
and really like the theme of high holy days is just really present in our bodies and in our minds um and trying to just be with that a little bit and not get you know it, it's very tricky it's a really really beautiful way of approaching the high holy days but it's also a very ashkenazi approach to the mm. high holy days if you look at um the safadi custom uh, particularly around yom kippur yom kippur is a day of joy and celebration and the music is uplifting and is positive and joyous because this is our chance for a second go right the slate is wiped clean we will be forgiven we're told um and it's it's you know this beautiful opportunity that we're offered um i think a lot of people that love that tune right at the start of Ne'ila and we think oh we're getting towards the el nara alila and there's this sort of approaching positivity that's a spanish and portuguese tune and a lot of the tunes through the day well before Ne'ila are also much more positive and uplifting um and i think that's a lot of what our holy days are about this year is actually trying to provide a huge variety of options for different people and their different needs because coming in in person isn't going to work for everyone being online isn't going to work for everyone and it's how do we create options for people to be able to do something that's meaningful for them over the high holy days whichever approach they're taking i think that piece around um holding those different uh, emotions as well is really important um that we uh, have very much focused on that sense of wanting you know we were desperate to build community and to be physically together as much as we could for as many people as we could and that's why we've done the like outside option to try and do that as safely as possible but that thing of what emotions does that stir the the kind of is that going to mean that that creates a real sense of joy and positivity because finally we're here and we can see each other and we're together or does it exacerbate the kind of the feelings of uh insecurity and anxiety and vulnerability um and all of these emotions that are stirred by the liturgy you know uh, on rosh hashanah that we um we we write ourselves in the book of life and in, on yom kippur that that fate is sealed and like really that's you know that grating kind of tone of uh, passing before god on yom kippur and um, who will live and who will die we've been living that all year and actually uh, you know i'm angry by that liturgy now um mm. i don't want to feel that vulnerability and how do we hold that tension um you know when you look out into the community and you know what people have been through this year uh, and then they're faced with those words i've really struggled with that that liturgy for many years i, f I find it really troubling um that image but i've heard other rabbis teach it so beautifully um and understand it so differently and again it's that sense of there are so many different ways into this um but yeah i find who shall live and who shall die all that stuff is it's really troubling when you when you lose someone in that year um it's very painful and that's part of coming out of this is also that mental health impact of what we've been living through. It's not just about our physical health now. Coming together and being a community is also about responding to our mental health needs. Mm. Um, so how do you guys mentally prepare and get ready for the High Holy Days? Is, do you read, Robin, do you read um, Lou every year? I don't read that book. Every, well, yes, sometimes I do. This year I haven't. I feel like this year, everything that I usually do to prepare hasn't quite happened or it's happening in a rushed way. So usually, you know, I get, the, well, these, these are kind of practical things that help to clean out the cobwebs to get ready. So I get the car cleaned. I have my hair cut. Um, I usually do things around the house in like the few, a month beforehand in a sense of just like cleansing and getting ready and buying new clothes and that kind of thing. I find that really helpful in terms of getting into a spiritual space it's like part of the spiritual prep I've not had well I, f I felt like I've not had time to do that this year um I had my hair cut like the day before I read Rosh Hashanah but I did, I did fit it in which I'm happy about um but I, I mean for me I find one of the benefits of our job is that um I have to turn into Jewish liturgy obviously and the calendar all the time so even though I'm feeling quite stressed and um you know underprepared in some ways I have to prepare a Shabbat service and it's about Elul. So in that sense, I kind of have to open up a book and look for 
right, where are we? What does this mean? What meaning can we get from it in this time? And I find that preparation of services can sometimes be really helpful to get into the headspace of where I need to be for it. Um, and I still love my coloring pencils, post-it notes, you know, all of that stuff. Um, I like everything super pretty and prepared for going in. And that's kind of my preparation for it. How about you, Miriam? Um, so, Debbie, I know you've been the um, queen of mikvah education for um, a very long time. And I've jumped on your bandwagon uh, in the last few years. Um, but I am doing something new this year as a, a kind of a new preparation, which is um, taking a group of members to um, Hampstead Ponds um, just the day before Erev Rosh Hashanah uh, and doing a piece there around kind of um, endings and new beginnings and uh, what does it mean to approach the new year in a very kind of physical way um, and uh, I'm doing it as much for me as I am for them um, that I, I think it will be a really interesting new way of being able to um, prepare for the high holy days and, and take it in a different place than the you know endless cue sheets and the massive kind of event planning piece um which becomes so much part of it you know i think for a lot of people they think the the clergy kind of just turn up and open the machs or piece or that we spend hours you know in a in a dark study kind of reading and, and writing our sermons and actually there's this whole other piece which is creating a, a huge event and um because we're doing this kind of piece in a new way with lots of technology and um in a new kind of venue trying to hold kind of screens and stages and sound and all of that kind of thing um i think i think sunday will be a really interesting way of being able to say um how do we prepare in a in a different way um, but i think i'm also slightly scarred in terms of high holy day preparation because i was in my first year at leo beck um uh when 9 11 happened and i had obviously as students do prepared very far in advance i had every word written and everything kind of you know ready to go and uh, an elderly wonderful um kind of colleague who i was i was going to wimbledon reform for my first service straight after 9 11 and had obviously written my sermon and everything else and he said to me um you're just a student don't change anything nobody expects you to respond to this this is um this is more than you need to talk about just don't worry and i actually think uh, it was the worst piece of advice i could have been given and i know i still hold on to that thing of that's not why people came to shul that year you know that 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 day people needed us to be responding to what was going on around and not my frivolous sermon of i don't know what i even spoke about um and so i do hold on to the fact that actually however much preparation we do we have to be in the moment as well and responding to exactly what the world throws at us whenever mm. the world throws you know its stuff at us and of course this year is quite similar to the year uh, in 2001 when 9-11 happened. Um, first of all, it's the 20th anniversary and we can't not talk about that. But I think, um, so we're having a special Shabbat service on Shabbat Shiva, which is 9-11. Uh, um, but I think, I, I, I remember really strongly all these strange stories that emerged after 9-11 because it happened in the 10 days it's not always in the 10 days but it is this year and it was that year the 10 days are the 10 days that we walk between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur um days of focused prayer and repentance and um lots of Jews um who are sort of more observant might go to synagogue every morning of those 10 days and I remember these stories that emerged after 9-11 of how oh well the Jews were responsible because lots of them weren't in the twin towers yet they weren't at work yet um and they they were saved um because they'd gone to shul <sighs> to, to pray for the 10 days and of course lots of jews were there did lose their lives um but the you know the conspiracy theories that can evolve so fast from something completely coincidental it was devastating at the time um but i mean my memories of of that time are still really clear i was a, a student field worker for um rsgb as it then was um 
and we were at our first UJS educational conference at Carmel College where there was like one TV on the entire site in the caretaker's home. No one had smartphones yet um, and just during a session everyone started getting these text messages from home. Um, including me my brother was sat in front of the tv texting me that world war three was starting mm. um and um my colleague from um one of the other movements who was a new student film who just arrived in london from new york where she'd been studying at jts um was you know that was her home being bombed in front of her um so i drove her back to london um to be with with her people really to be with community because that's what we need at these times mm. however um however awful things are we want to be together usually yeah i mean gabriel came back from school his first day was yesterday um and he'd learned about 9 11 for the first time his teacher had kind of explained it so he was telling me what he thought had happened and we kind of un unpicked it a little bit and he just couldn't get his his mind around what had happened why it happened who had done it why they killed themselves, you know, why didn't they jump out of a plane before what was going on? He was so confused about it um, and trying to explain like what fundamentalism is and what extremism is. And it, I don't know, I was kind of reflecting on what you were saying, Miriam, about your first experience of that sermon going in. And it's always this tricky balance I find in services of wanting to create a refuge really in a sense from the outside world. And, you know, I think partly music can do that because it can comfort and soothe and, you know, talk to emotion without having to name things. But at the same time, and an American rabbi said this, I don't know who, what, I've forgotten her name, uh, but said that prayer is spiritual sustenance for the revolution, right? So it's not that it's separate from it, but you're able to get what you need to then go out and act in the world. So it's not about ignoring what's going on in the world and it has to be spoken about. And it's that challenge of the balance of, how much do we talk about COVID? Like, how do we help people process that without it being everywhere and being able to give people the space to experience what they need in that space um, or wanting a break from it? Like, and, that, and, you know, how do you hold the anger? Like Miriam, you were saying, I'm so angry at this liturgy. And I know that we already, because we've only just started going back to Shaw at um, Jackson's Row, um, and there's this like nostalgic return. It's like, oh, I can't wait to get back into synagogue. This is going to be everything. I remember how special it used to be. And you get there and there are now TV monitors there. Um, we're sitting separately. You know, most of the community is on Zoom still and it feels different. And there's like a, a kind of sense of disappointment and, oh, we're still in the world of the pandemic. And that is being experienced like over and over again. Um, and it reminds us of um, one of our teachers, Sheila Shulman, Zichran Alivracha, Rabbi Sheila, would always quote this line from Ursula Le Guin, a science fiction writer. You can go home again as long as you know that home is a place you've never been, which of course is to Shuva, which is returning of like the high holy days. And it seems so apt again this year of like, and, and with the 9-11 anniversary, there is something about that, about the world has shifted. It, you know, it is the same world in a sense, but also everything's changed and shifted and how... How do you hold comfort and gentleness alongside that kind of fragility and the, the cracks in the earth as well? I think there's also really interesting questions about where we feel that vulnerability. I think it's before the pandemic, the high holy days were always sort of you know, high security moments when we became very strict about who was coming in and who was going out. And there's a new vulnerability that we now feel and trying to plan for that as well. Um, you know, it just takes so much attention from so many different people yeah. and all these kind of um, amazing lay leaders who are alongside the professionals are giving up their evenings and daytimes to make all of this happen. It's, uh, it's an incredible feat, really. Yeah, there are so many people working so hard to make it a meaningful experience as well. I have to say that I had a moment of... Um, extreme vulnerability on the way this morning um i was dropping gabriel off at school um, and rushing back because we we meet just after the school run don't we so i was going making sure i get back and i got into the car just to text someone to say one of you to say i'm going to be a little bit late because of the school run and my phone had turned on to sos so um it had sent messages to all of my emergency contacts saying there's been an emergency here's the pinpoint location of where it happened please you know help um and 
my family were calling me and they hadn't been able to get in touch for 30 minutes um and you know went to strange places of thinking what had happened to like a car accident to me being abducted um which says a lot um and um it wasn't i think because we're in one a pandemic two i think the world feels like it's shifting like afghanistan also linked to 9 11 there feels like there's something really destabilizing and terrifying about the rise of the taliban or the you know the rise again of the taliban and being in the high holy day mode that hit me so much more than i think it would have done normally like normally it would be quite a funny story to tell this time it feels like you know una tane toka for yom kippur liturgy um, the liturgy that we sing over the high holy days who by fire who by water like you're you know, you're a you're a thin strand away from it um but I, I was speaking to um someone yesterday who lost his wife very young um and very recently um and he was talking about the piece you mentioned miriam about in deuteronomy about choose life i put before you life and death choose life i put before you blessings and curse choose blessings and he was saying that with all the grief one of the ways what he he wants to live his life fully because he can see what that death you know has done to his family and how precious life is as well um and i think that kind of goes back to what you were saying debbie like hopefully the high holy days that's where we get to right that we face mortality and we can hold the grief in some way and the pain and be alongside it but we get to choose life because we come out choosing life we come out renewed and able to put an, you know the next step forward and see the world anew um rather than it being something that takes us deep down into the vulnerability and terrified of what might happen the the point is that we're renewed and we go towards Sukkot and Simchat Torah you know we're, we're kind of brought on a bit of a journey really we've um started doing this like for a number of months um this parallel piece of um our prayers for healing and a Shechechianu moment that uh, it feels very much like that's where that this high holy days kind of um is on that precipice as well that there's the kind of the prayers for healing the acknowledgement that we're still very much in this and feeling vulnerable and um as you say the world does just feel like an uncertain unstable um place whether it's the environment and nature whether it's humankind and you know i i i love gabriel's sort of sense of how do you even start to comprehend that kind of yeah. evil right that actually he should net he should always be confused that there should be anybody anyone in the world that can can hold that kind of level of hatred and evil um and and that's so much the one side of things and on the other side this like constant need for the affirmation that we are the survivors in this that we are um the ones who are still here uh, and that in some way that gives us even more of an obligation to um to live and to keep living and to enjoy life and to find those moments of blessing and um, acknowledge all of those tiny things that we used to take for granted for so long and now are wrapped up with such beauty and such joy because they've been denied us for so long or we've just seen what life is like without them. Um, and I think if we can achieve a high holy day journey that allows people to rock between those two places mm -hmm. and to feel that they are managing to hold both of those um i think it's quite extraordinary i think there'll be many people um in the community almost kind of dealing with a sort of post-traumatic stress kind of attitude to this and yet also we're still kind of in it uh, you know i'm really aware um of what it must feel like for our school leadership teams um, and our teachers to be walking back into the classroom this term yeah. and with that uncertainty of what what does this look like now um you know as a synagogue i was fascinated to hear debbie saying they'd started planning for this high holy days you know their their lay leaders had met during pesach um, my lay leaders would have loved me to have been um you know part of those discussions much much earlier than we were having them and i kept saying we can't plan we can't plan we don't know what it's going to be like <laughs> you know let's hold off let's wait for the certainty the certainty never came um <laughs> so perhaps <laughs> the planning uh, was a little more delayed than it needed to be but that thing of we just live our lives now with such uncertainty which I suppose is what a lot of the High Holy Days is about, right? There is so much uncertainty and we we hold that through the liturgy, through the unknown and um, <clears throat> trying to understand ourselves and take time to think about who we're going to be despite that uncertainty. 
um one of the um one of the ways that I like to prepare for um Rosh Hashanah is uh, a ritual called soul candles which is the making of um candles in memory um of those who've gone and also to pray for the living um it's a, a ritual that came out of the uh, shtetls and was lost for many years because we left our graveyards and part of the ritual was to measure out the wick of the candles around the um graveyards but i often think that elul uh, the month we're in before rosh hashanah is this time of visiting our dead partly to remind ourselves of the uncertainty of life and, and we you know we we can't plan everything we don't necessarily choose when we're born and when we die um but also that we want to live our lives in honor and in uh you know honoring the work and the memories of those who've gone before us um and i think that's even more sort of exacerbated this year with so much that's been lost for people um, whether it's um, loved ones and relatives or actually freedoms and different sacrifices that we've made um, and using the high holy days in a way to come to terms with those losses um, and that grief that we're feeling because there's a lot of grief that we revisit during Elul and I think there are other griefs now there's 9-11 but there's also these other losses of the last 18 months that we need to take time to process. Mm, I find that so powerful, Debbie. I mean, on, on Sunday, um, I'm going with my mum to visit my granddad's grave, which happens to every, all of our other family members aren't in Manchester, but he is in Bury nearby, and we're going to go and visit his grave. And it's really interesting when you said about honouring the memory of them. And I th- if I think about that generation, and we still have many people in that generation in our community, my granddad, you know, as many of them did, went to war when he was a young boy, was sent across the globe on a boat, um and i've actually got um, a quotation of a psalm in front of me that was his favorite psalm because it talked about calm waters in, in a stormy sea um, Mikolot Mayim Rabim, and it was his favorite psalm because it spoke to him of that terror of being on a boat in a storm by himself thinking i'm going to die and you know he got shot he got tb when he was out there you know imagining what they went through and i often it's actually interesting at the beginning of the lockdown i went to so many um holocaust survivors writings to honor them but also to get to learn the lessons from them about about how to deal with such i mean that was you know such immense tragedy and hate on a scale that is very different and completely different to what we're going through in the pandemic but um honoring the memory and the lessons that can be learned from them and standing on their shoulders is so important and thinking about our machzarim our prayer books of course are written by well n- not our new ones so much but the one we still use for yom kippur are written by the mainly the men who came out the rabbis who came out of the holocaust who were teaching post-holocaust theology how do we stay together what does this look like to be jewish how do you deal with deep suffering and i think for me that's why our machsarim are so powerful because they are responding to something that is that needs responding to you know they didn't shy away from it but they were having that conversation and i think even more so now you know, I think, oh, should I bring different liturgy and creative liturgy? And like, it's all there actually, because they're having the conversation that needs to happen in a sense. Um, so but powerful. I also think that's why it's so important that we are now working on a new machso, because yeah. it is a new generation and we are dealing with a new way of processing and moving past what it was to be the generation that survived. Not to forget um, yeah, and not to continue to honour that memory, but actually we're moving into the generation that will decide essentially what meaning is drawn out for the next generation from all of this. Um, And we saw with the new Siddur that was, it's already not new, um, but I still call it the new Siddur, it was published in 2008. Um, You know, there was a shift from a book that was filled with etchings of all these destroyed synagogues that were no longer with us, replaced by beautiful modern artwork that would help us focus on the prayers in a different way. And, you know, things do shift and change and our grief shifts and changes. Um, and I'm really uh, looking forward, actually, to uh, seeing what the new generation Machsel will look like in the next few years. It's sort of almost there, I believe. That's exciting. I think, um, for me, there's a real hope that um, people use the High Holy Days maybe differently this year but I know for a lot of people all that we've been talking about is really clergy and for them you know Rosh Hashanah is actually about the best 
honey cake recipe, uh, you know, where they're having dinner, lunch, tea, whatever it is with which members of the family on which days and that kind of thing. And I hope, I really hope that that isn't lost for them and that 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 sense of High Holy Days as a kind of celebratory and family time uh, is, is there for them as well. But I hope that part of this conversation has also made people sort of say, maybe I need something this High Holy Days above and beyond that. Maybe I want to look for a service I can go to or study sessions or, you know, whether it's a late night slichot service on Saturday night or whether it's a, a jolly and fun um, you know, experience for kids um, or whether it's a, a space um, to process the year that's passed. Uh, I hope people will um, look online at reformjudaism.org.uk uh, and find out where there is either a, a synagogue near them doing those things that they can uh, book into and uh, turn up to, or what uh, Zoom services, streaming services are available to them, um, and what educational resources and uh, are available to them online, and also to, to find the gem of those machsorim online and to kind of pour over them themselves, um, because uh, it is all there. Uh, and I hope that you'll um, find it, reformjudaism.org.uk, and they can also find up the uh, past episodes of Rabbiting On if they need to uh, catch up there as well. You've got a quiet moment through the hugging. You can just catch up on Rabbiting On. <laughs> um, so do stay with us over the High Holy Days. We'll be here again with another episode in a couple of weeks. But for now, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Shana Tava to you. Uh, a very sweet and hopeful new year from the Movement for Reform Judaism and from all of us. Um, I wish my colleagues and all of their wonderful lay leaders strength and uh, a meaningful hagim. And we hope to see you all in a couple of weeks. Shana Tava, everybody. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Shana Tova.